introduction. There are two applications before me. One is an application where the applicant seeks leave to appeal the sentence in terms of section 31, 316, capital B of the Criminal Procedure Act number 51 of 1977. In the second application, the applicant has made an application for the reservation of certain questions of law in terms of section 319 of the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977 for the consideration of the Supreme Court of Appeal. Before I proceed with the applications, it, it is necessary at the outset to deal with two issues raised by the applicant in the application and by the respondent in his opposition papers respectively. Although these points were not pressed by counsel, and rightly so, they warrant attention as they have a potential to lead to a misperception of how courts function. One, in paragraph 35 of its application for the reservation of questions of law, the applicant states the following, I quote, 35, we further submit that there are special circumstances for the court to grant leave to appeal for these questions of law to be reserved, namely huge public interest in the case both locally and internationally, dot, 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 close quote. In my view, the degree of public interest in a particular matter is not relevant and it cannot determine the outcome of any matter that is before court. In terms of our constitution, everyone is equal before the law. It follows, therefore, that this application will be treated only on its own merits, not on the basis that the case attracted public interest. The second point was raised by the respondent in his opposition papers. In paragraph four, and five, the following is stated, I quote, four, for purposes of considering whether or not to grant leave, it is respectfully submitted that the test applicable to appeals, namely that a court may have proper regard to events that occurred subsequent to the passing of sentence, as long as the subsequent events are not in dispute applies. Five, it cannot be in dispute that the parents of the deceased and also through their legal representative, Advocate De Brain, SC, express their satisfaction with the sentence. It is a material factor, close quote. While there'll be some instances where events that occurred subsequent to the passing of sentence might be relevant, this is not one of them. Counsel for the applicant readily agreed with this court that the views of the parents of the deceased on the sentence imposed on the accused are irrelevant. There was no counter argument in this regard on behalf of the respondent. While I agree that a sentence imposed should do justice, not only to the community, but also to the parents of the deceased, in brackets C R V S K A R G, spelled K A R G, 1961, Volume One, Capital S A, 231, Capital A in brackets. It seems to me that once a court has correctly exercised its discretion in imposing a sentence, the views of the public about the appropriateness or otherwise of the sentence are immaterial and they cannot influence the outcome of an application for leave to appeal. Application in terms of section 316, capital B, subsection 1. The grounds of appeal are set out in the application. In paragraph 2.9, the, the applicant concludes 
Court 2.9 that there is a reasonable prospect that another court may come to a different finding with regards to the sentence imposed by this court and may in fact overturn the sentences imposed close quote. Interference with a sentence on appeal is not justified in the absence of material misdirection or irregularity or where the sentence imposed is not shockingly inappropriate as to create a sense of shock. The grounds as set out in the application suggest that all the requirements for the interference by an appeal court have been met. In none of the submission, however, by counsel for the applicant, did I understand that there was a misdirection which was such that it could vitiate this court's decision on sentence. Although counsel for the applicant argued that the sentence was inappropriate and shockingly light for someone that killed an innocent person with gross negligence, where such conduct, conduct bordered on dolus eventualis, I am not persuaded that there was any material misdirection or irregularity or that on the facts of this matter, the sentence imposed is shockingly inappropriate and induces a sense of shock. The application in terms of section 31B, 316 capital B, subsection one therefore cannot succeed. Application for the reservation of points of law in terms of section 319. The questions concerned in this application have been summarized in the applicant's heads of argument as follows. I quote, one, if the principles of dolus eventualis were correctly applied to the accepted facts and the conduct of the accused, including error in objecto, and or two, whether the court correctly conceived and applied the legal principles pertaining to circumstantial evidence and or pertaining to multiple defenses by an accused. Three, if the court was correct in its construction and reliance on an alternative version of the accused and that this alternative version was reasonably possibly true and or four, if the court correctly conceived and applied the legal principles pertaining to the possession of ammunition while not in legal possession of an arm to fire such ammunition, close quote. The grounds of the applications are set out clearly in the application and it would serve no purpose to, to repeat them here. The application is opposed and grounds of such opposition are also clearly set out in the respondent's opposition papers. The main point argued extensively by both counsel was whether the questions raised by the applicant in its application are questions of law or questions of fact masquerading as questions of law. There were, of course, other points argued by counsel for the applicant. However, the preliminary questions as correctly submitted by counsel for the respondent is whether or not the questions raised or the question raised is one of law or one of fact. Whether or not a question genuinely raises a question of law is not always such an easy question to answer. That this is in fact so was clear from submissions by counsel who both argued ably and supported their submissions with case law. Also, see in this regard S. V. Basson, 2007, Volume 1, capital S-A-C-R, 566, in brackets, capital CC, close brackets, especially 
where the court in paragraph 12 refers to a Supreme Court of Appeal ruling that the admissibility of the bail record gave rise to factual issues and not questions of law and struck such question from the role while the constitutional court's preliminary judgment held that the SCA had erred in this respect and that the question of the bail record did give rise to a question of law. In the present case, we are dealing with a matter which, as counsel for the applicant correctly submitted, is not an easy one. Counsel for the respondent sought to demonstrate to this court that there, in quotes, purported, close quotes, questions of law raised by the applicant were questions of fact and that the attack was clearly aimed at the court's factual findings. Having perused the application in brackets, especially into earlier paragraphs 12, 13 and 23, close brackets, and case law referred to brackets C. Mahmoud v. Jan Van Rensbeck and others, 1993, volume 1, capital SA, 777, capital A in brackets, at pages, <coughs> excuse me, at pages 781G and 799 respectively, close brackets, I have been persuaded that the questions in respect of count one as set out by the applicant, by the applicant are questions of law. That being so, I cannot say after considering submissions by counsel that the prospect of success at the Supreme Court of Appeal is remote. I am also of the view that if the points succeed, this might have a, a, a practical effect on the conviction. The application, therefore, in respect of count one, falls to be decided in favor of the applicant. In respect of count four, I am of the view, however, that the cases referred to by the applicant do not support his application for reservation of a question of law in terms of section 319. The application in respect of this count, therefore, falls to be dismissed. Conclusion. In the result, in respect of the application, in terms of section 316, capital B, subsection 1, the following order is granted. One, the application for leave to appeal against sentence is dismissed. Two, it is ordered that the applicant pay the cost of the respondent in opposing the application to be taxed according to the scale in civil cases of the High Court as envisaged in section 316, capital B, subsection 3. In respect of the application in terms of section 319, I am satisfied that the points raised by the applicant in respect of count one are indeed questions of law. Accordingly, the following questions of law are reserved for the consideration of the Supreme Court of Appeal. One, whether the principles of dolus eventualis were correctly applied to the accepted facts and the conduct of the accused, including error in objecto. Two, whether the court correctly conceived and applied the legal principles pertaining to circumstantial evidence and or pertaining to multiple defenses by an accused. Three, whether the court was correct in its construction and reliance on an alternative version of the accused and that this alternative version was reasonably possibly true. 
And lastly, in respect of count four, the application is refused. <laughs> Ms. Johnson, before I adjourn, I believe there's something that you wanted to hand over. Thank you very much. Court religion.